just so you know what you're getting yourself into, I'm a computer nerd, and I'm going to review the Surface Book. Why? Well, because I have one. Now let's break this video down into four basic parts. Uh, this is the unboxing and the visual eye candy, uh, the normal functionality, uh, the cool stuff, and the not so cool stuff, and then the really nerdy stuff. Because last time I went kind of overboard, if you saw the Surface Pro 3 video that we did here at Tech Syndicate, then uh, yeah, I went sort of crazy. Uh, it was good, but you know, turned the nerdiness up to about a 9.5, give or take. I'm gonna dial it back just a little bit on this and talk a little bit more about usability and some of the other nerdy stuff, but don't worry, I'll get fairly nerdy. Um, so first off, let's talk about the eye candy. The Surface Book is designed with a similar aesthetic to the Surface Pro 3 and the Surface Pro 4. And the Surface 3, uh, it's a silvery magnesium alloy finish uh, and it's textured. Um, this is sort of Microsoft's answer to the Windows laptop. So Microsoft has been working on their Surface line. But now we also have the Surface Book, a new and interesting piece of hardware from Microsoft in that it's a laptop that can convert into a tablet, whereas the Surface Pro has always been a tablet that can also be a laptop. But the Surface Book, on the other hand, is actually a really solid laptop and the screen is detachable. Now this isn't the first laptop with a detachable screen, but Microsoft has some tricks up their sleeves as far as that goes, but we'll talk about that more in a minute. I was really generally overall very satisfied with the build quality. There were a few little weird things, like when you open the Surface Book all the way, the little hinge, the special hinge that it has, uh, will sort of make the base of the laptop a little bit longer, so it's a little bit more rigid and a little bit more stable. But the hinge will come in contact with whatever surface your Surface is on. Surface. Surface. Uh, anyway, I think that that's for stability. I don't think they had a choice not to do it that way because otherwise it would it would tilt back a little bit or, or do something like that. But it's really easy for the magnesium to get scuffed up on that hinge. For me, the design aesthetic is really clean. Uh, there are vent holes all the way around and just three buttons on the top part. Power on and then volume up and down. Those are your three buttons. Just like the Surface tablets. I did find that it was really easy to accidentally hit the power button when the Surface was in your bag or when it was otherwise closed. And it will happily turn on, get hot, and run the battery all the way down. I really hope that they add a thing to the UEFI so that if you turn it on with the lid closed, it'll just go back to sleep because they really ought to do that and it's not like that right now. Now, unlike the Surface Pro 3 and the Surface Pro 4, where there's a micro SD slot behind the, the sort of the kickstand that those have, this laptop has a full-size SD card slot, but the SD card slot, you can't fit an SD card all the way inside the laptop. Now, you can get an SD to micro SD adapter that is sort of a compact size. I happen to have this one from Adafruit, and it basically fits all the way inside the laptop. So if you're planning to use an SD card for media storage or something like that, you'll have to get one of these adapters to permanently install. Alternately, you can get a 128 gig or 64 gig flash drive to plug in the USB port and use that. It'll stick out a little bit, but it's still not too bad for extra storage. For me, I opted to get the 512 gig version so that I would have ample storage. Now in terms of other connectivity, there are two USB 3 ports on this side along with the memory card, the SD card slot. And then on the other side, there's the display slash dock connector. And then you've also got the normal standard mini display port uh, port for your monitor. Of course, when you're looking at the Surface Book for the first time, the really the first thing that catches your eye is the hinge. The hinge goes all the way across and it's a very sort of unique mechanism. The laptop sort of ends up being wedge shaped, which is kind of unusual. I think as far as the hinge goes, some people will like it, some people are not gonna like it. Me personally, I like it. Mechanically, and in terms of the engineering, it's really clever. You see, there's a lot of hardware in the screen, and there's a lot of hardware in the keyboard. And to avoid the laptop being top heavy so that when you open it, you know, the screen is weighing it down and then you touch the screen, it may be off center, it may be off balance, so that the, the whole thing tilts back. So this hinge kind of unrolls, and that provides more stability um, for the overall laptop because what it does effectively is it makes the whole device just a little bit longer and so that sort of changes the center of gravity for the laptop so that the screen can be a little bit heavier and the weight in the keyboard, especially the front of the keyboard, acts like a lever to keep the whole thing steady. It's really a pretty clever approach and I think it works really well for their use case. The other thing that was interesting was when it was closed and you hold it like a book, I found that holding it you know, holding it in my right hand and writing with my left hand and doing some other stuff with my left hand felt very natural. It felt almost like the, the binding of a book or something like that, like a paperback book where you've got the, the cover uh, curled around and you're holding it in one hand. I actually found it easier to hold that way, um, although you can detach the screen and just use the screen by itself. That's completely fine too, but the battery in the screen will only last, you know, two to four hours. 
when you're opening the screen, the hinge also kind of has a divot in it. So when you open it all, uh, when you open it up, it sort of has a spot that it wants to go to. Now you can keep opening it further than that, but I think this angle, the reason they did that is so that when you touch the laptop, it doesn't really want to move around or wiggle too much. So even though you can set the screen at whatever angle you want, there are two angles that are really optimized for touch. And then if you put them in those angles, the screen's not going to move around too much. Now, if you try to put the screen at another angle and use it for touch, then it's going to move around a little bit. But for this, this angle and then the farther back angle, that's a perfect angle for touch. And it's got kind of a locking mechanism to prevent it from moving around too much while you're touching the screen. Now the bottom of the Surface Book is completely nondescript except for two long rubber feet at the back of the device. Um, the Surface Book has the profile of a wedge, as I said before. Uh, it's a very sexy, lightweight device, uh, but it's a wedge nonetheless. I found it difficult to open one-handed uh, the normal way where, you know, I would just put my hand on the front and, you know, sort of like do this kind of a maneuver to try to, to flip it open, but that doesn't really work. What you've got to do instead when you're holding the laptop is sort of put your finger in here and run it down the edge until this until the laptop pops open. Uh, once I got used to opening the laptop that way, I found it very easy to open one-handed. So that's something to keep in mind. I think the reason they went with such a strong magnetic seal was to prevent the uh, laptop from opening up in your bag and waking up and getting hot and then dying. Now with the Surface Book open, you can really appreciate the three by two aspect ratio screen. This is not a normal 16 by nine screen that you see on most laptops today. Uh, essentially the screen is taller. It is about the same height as a traditional 15.6 inch laptop, but a little bit more narrow. And it's about 13.6 inches diagonally. It is a gorgeous 3000 by 2000 resolution, which means you'll probably be using Windows Display Scaling in order to be able to read it. And Windows Display Scaling is not without its own faults, but I'll just say that if you're using Windows Display Scaling and you're also using legacy applications, you may actually want to run Windows at a lower resolution so that you don't have to use Windows Display Scaling because it's still not right if you're running legacy applications. If you're running applications that support it though, it's, it's gorgeous, it works really well. It's just like Retina Display on a Mac. But if you got older Windows applications, the Windows Display Scaling can make them crash and do some seriously weird stuff. So keep that in mind. The bezel on this is also quite a bit smaller than is seen on the Surface Pro line of, of tablets from Microsoft. Now, I didn't test this for color reproduction myself, and the reports from the industry on these displays is that the color reproduction is very, very good. And in one report, it actually edged out the iPad Pro, and that's something that Apple always has paid attention to in terms of you know color accuracy and color reproduction on their devices, which a lot of people liked. Also, while we're looking at the screen, you'll notice the recessed speaker Design. Now this originally came up on the Surface Pro 3 and the engineer that did this I think really knows what they're doing. Uh, this has some of the best sound that I've ever heard from a laptop of this size and weight class. Uh, the Surface Book improves the design of the Surface Pro 3, which is the first place this showed up at, by having a low density material fill the cutout gaps that are in the screen for the speakers. Now next up we have the pen. Out of the box, you have to twist the pen to turn it on. Now this pen is the same pen between Surface Pro 4 and the Surface Book, and it's even backward compatible with the Surface Pro 3. The pen has a top eraser button and a single recessed button at the end of the rubber strip. This is different than the Surface Pro 3 pen, which had two buttons, but you couldn't use the eraser like an eraser. With this one, you can actually use the eraser like an eraser. For creative types, the pen accuracy on the Surface Book is really just an incremental improvement over the previous generation Surface Pro 3 as well, although there are some minor lingering issues reported by some blogger artists out there. At this point, I think the only better digitizer drawing option is probably a dedicated tablet from um, Wacom, maybe the one Wacom Cintiq or something like that, but those will be a little bit more expensive. The iPad Pro also has not yet been well received as far as drawing and tablet functionality goes, although the hardware is not terrible for a drawing tablet. I think that a lot of that is probably just the software waiting to catch up because the iPad Pro is really just a larger iPad, whereas the Surface line of stuff is a full-fledged computer, and with this, this is closer to a laptop than a tablet, although you can go into tablet mode. The pen comes wired up to OneNote and Cortana by default, so you can tap the button once to bring up OneNote, or you can double click to bring up Cortana, or you've got a third option where you can take a screenshot with the pen. Now, of course, that's configurable and different applications will allow you to set even more customizations in terms of what the buttons do on the pen. The keyboard is the next thing up on my list to discuss. It's great. Uh, easily, this is one of the best laptop keyboards on a Windows laptop that I have ever used, ever. The key travel, the feeling, the tactile feedback, just the way that it feels is great. The key spacing between keys, the layout, everything is really good. I can only complain a little bit about the up arrow key. I really, 
it was like this on the Surface Pro 3. I don't really care for the combined up, down arrow key, but I've gotten used to it and it's really not terrible. But other than that, the keyboard experience on this is completely enjoyable. They also finally got the touchpad right, I think, in, in my opinion. Uh, it's probably the best Windows trackpad that I've ever used. Uh, the only real downside on the trackpad is that mechanically, it's only clicky for about the bottom two thirds of the pad. So if you're somebody who's used to mechanically clicking the pad, uh, it's not going to be that great. But if you're a tap person and you don't mechanically click the touchpad, then you'll be fine. You can just tap and you can continue to tap as normal and it's completely okay. I would recommend also in the software when you get the Surface that you go in and configure it um, for two finger scroll delay because by default it's something like a half a second. And so when you touch, it feels, at least that's what it feels like. So when you touch the touchpad and start two finger scrolling, it can feel kind of sluggish to respond, but there's actually a software setting for that and you can set it for a low delay. I think Microsoft does that uh, because they probably ran a test and most people didn't even know about two finger scroll or they were squirrely users or something. And so the focus group said, ah, people may not understand two finger scroll. Let's put the delay in there so that you have to be touching the thing for five minutes before it'll actually go into two finger scroll mode. But you can change the preference for that. I set mine to low delay and it's very responsive. The, the touchpad is unbelievably responsive. It's one of the best, if not the best Windows trackpad that I've ever used. I can't believe it. They finally got it right. It's, it's unbelievable. The Mac people have had that for, for years and they're not wrong. Apple for all of its fault has a damn good touchpad on their laptops, but uh, it's nice to, see, to finally have it on something that's not Apple hardware. So there's that. At the top of the keyboard, you can see vent holes. Now one nerdy thing under the hood, we're gonna talk about more later, is the video card in the keyboard. Yeah, I know that's crazy. Uh, but it is. The video card and the keyboard, it really is. Uh, everything else is in the screen, but the keyboard contains the main battery and the GPU. And this thing has about 70 watt hours of battery power, most of which is in the, in the keyboard part. But there is a secondary battery in the screen, so the screen can run independently for two to four hours. So that's something. Now, not all Surface Book models have the dedicated NVIDIA GPU in the keyboard, but this one does. The particular model that we're looking at here is the Intel Core i7. That's a 6600U with a maximum turbo clock of 3.4 gigahertz, a stock, a, a normal speed of 2.6 gigahertz, and you know, it can down clock to like 500 or 800 megahertz or something like that. This is the 16 gigabytes of RAM model with a 512 gig SSD. Uh, the GPU is a special version. It's a special, special present from NVIDIA. It's the GM108. It's about equivalent to an, an NVIDIA 940M, but it's only got one gigabyte of video memory. I think this is also only connected with two PCI Express lanes, but being a 940M, it's not really gonna bottleneck because we're talking PCI Express 3.0, but it's interesting that the interconnect between the screen and the keyboard is PCI Express. But we'll talk more about that in the nerdy section. Now in terms of the 940M and the performance there, uh, yeah, this is not a gaming laptop. This is an ultra portable. The 940M really gives you better performance in applications like the Adobe Creative Suite and other software that can benefit from GPU acceleration. So this laptop, is really made for creative people that want something super portable and on the go with a pretty good to crazy battery life. Yes, there are laptops out there with way more graphics horsepower. Yes, there are laptops out there with way, way more CPU horsepower. But in terms of portability versus battery life versus performance, I think this is pretty top tier just for its weight class, the size of the screen and how small it is overall. Right now, this is one of the top laptops in those categories. Now there are laptops, you know, like I say, that are faster, have more battery life, and but they're also gonna be heavier or more unwieldy. And so we're really talking about a 15 watt CPU. <laughs> With that, I've wandered into the nerdy section. So this is really cool. There's a GPU and the keyboard. It's got a PCI Express interconnect or Thunderbolt. It's almost a Thunderbolt type deal because you know, it is kind of hot plug sorta. And with that, you can detach the screen. So what happens is you press this button on the keyboard and then the light turns green if it can be ejected. So what has to happen here, what's going on? It's got a mechanical lock. So you can't separate the screen from the keyboard unless the software okays it. And that makes sense. I mean, some people are able to wiggle their screen and produce a blue screen. And I think this is because of noise on the PCI Express bus or Thunderbolt or ever how this has been implemented. Some kind of PCI Express, some kind of portable PCI Express. And the drivers just aren't set up to deal with that. I think it's gonna be a while before Nvidia really figures that out and really, really sets it up right. Now, the other interesting thing is that you have to jump through hoops to install both the Intel driver 
and the NVIDIA driver. And so like Star Wars Battlefront right now at the time of this video, if you're using the Microsoft official driver, you can't play Star Wars Battlefront. You have to have a newer version of the NVIDIA driver, and it just doesn't work on the Surface Book. But again, the Surface Book is not really meant for gaming. I mean, you can game on it. I was playing a little bit of Fallout and a little bit of GTA 5 just to see what it would do. You're going to be running at low resolutions, you know, 1280 by 800, 1280 by 720. Rocket League runs great at 1920 by 1080. Um, a lot of older games or DirectX 9 games run great at higher resolutions. But newer games are really not going to run at anything, you know, above uh, console resolution. Because, I mean, it's, it's basically equivalent to an NVIDIA 940M. The other weird thing is that the OpenCL drivers, so NVIDIA kind of supports OpenCL now, but the NVIDIA drivers that Microsoft provides don't actually support OpenCL, it's been neutered. And so I wonder if there's something weird, because you know, Microsoft's video game division uses AMD GPUs. I wonder if there's something in their licensing agreement or something in their legal agreement that prevents Microsoft from distributing OpenCL stuff with an NVIDIA chip. I don't know. But if you manually install it, it works fine. If you want to see more about that and the, like the nitty gritty of that, head on over to the tech forums and you know ask a question or, or post there because you can manually install both the Intel drivers and the NVIDIA drivers and basically be okay. The other tweak that you've got to do is set everything to maximum performance when you're plugged in because out of the box it tries not to have the thermals go too out of control so you can go into power management and set everything to maximum and actually get significantly higher performance from both the GPU and the CPU. The physical design of this where the heat producing CPUs in the screen and the heat producing GPUs in the bottom means that this thing can actually get quite a bit hotter than your normal laptop because the CPU and the GPU are physically separated. Normally on a laptop it's not like that. The CPU and the GPU often have a common heat pipe and so one is basically dumping heat into the other. The separate design of this gives Microsoft a lot more thermal room to deal with heat dissipation. So that works out really well for us the end user in terms of being able to have something that, that's a fairly crazy amount of horsepower whenever we're plugged into the wall. And so Microsoft says you're going to get 12 hours of, of battery life from this thing. Real world performance for me was actually 7 to 10 hours, which is pretty impressive. For a 15 watt CPU and an ultra portable, it was probably the right choice. Now in terms of the integrated graphics, it's the Intel HD Graphics 520. It has a maximum clock speed of 1 gigahertz. The big difference here is that 4K at 60 hertz, unlike the Surface Pro 3, is actually plug and play. Yeah, that's right. You can actually plug in an external 4K display and have it work. The good old Samsung U28D590D, which is like the worst 4K monitor ever, it was plug and play. It totally worked. Never could get that monitor to work with the Surface Pro 3. So let's talk about one other thing that's super nerdy with this thing. It was only recently enabled on the Windows 10 TH2 update. Intel SpeedShift. Yeah, another name for stuff. Ugh. So what is it? Well, what is SpeedShift? It's like, well, you know how the processor moves from 800 megahertz to faster clocks like 2.6 or 3.4 on the turbo side? Well, it turns out that takes time. And you've probably heard us talk about that in our other videos where we're talking about things like Haswell, where it's got the fully integrated voltage regulator, and they did that so the CPU would be able to better respond. And then they moved it back off on Skylake because it you know, wasn't as bad in the heat production and that kind of thing. Well, on Skylake, because these are, these are mobile Skylake CPUs, um, there are more hardware power states or P states um, that are available for the hardware to manage that kind of thing. And so when the CPU is going from 800 megahertz to 2.6 or, or 3.2, leaving the operating system to manage that means that it can take 60, 80, 100 milliseconds to do that. 100 milliseconds is a tenth of a second. So it's basically an eternity in terms of computation, in terms of like a responsive UI. So if you're sitting there with a laptop and you're reading something and then you reach out to touch the screen or you do something that requires computation on the laptop, then it has to wake up and move to a higher clock speed. And the time it takes to do that, uh, it sort of factors in to how responsive the user interface is. Well, with speed shift, you're able to do these things about three to 10 times faster, depending on, on what you're doing. I mean, it's able to do that. And some, some graphs are saying that it's, you know, six, eight milliseconds in terms of responding. And that's just because with the Windows 10 TH2 update, a lot of the P state changes where it goes from a low power state to a high power state happen in hardware. And because it's happening in hardware, it happens a lot faster. And so it's able to upshift and downshift a lot faster as well. So overall, you can still have greater power savings 
um, because you're not wasting so much time going from faster to slower, but it also means the system is more responsive. So when you touch a screen and scroll, you can see more stuff. Now PC Perspective actually has a really good write up and a demo of this where they've they got a high speed camera. I think it was just an iPhone camera, 120 hertz or whatever. And they were demoing it, you know, just scrolling a web page in, in Internet Explorer Edge or Internet Edge or whatever Microsoft wants to call their browser these days. And it was noticeably more responsive with speed shift because the system was able to wake up and respond to that, whereas it had been in a very low power state when it was just displaying information. I mean, that's how you get 12 hour battery life out of your laptop. And so it makes sense that they would try to improve the situation as far as responsiveness goes. And so Intel speed shift for new hardware that supports it was just enabled in the TH2 update. So it's nice to feel it on the Surface Book, and I could definitely tell a difference when the TH2 update was applied, just in terms of how applications responded, especially when I was traveling with the Surface Book. Let's do a mini review of the Microsoft Surface Dock. This is the new dock. This is for the Surface Pro 4 and the Surface Book. It's also backward compatible with the Surface Pro 3. Um, unlike the previous dock, where it actually mechanically snapped in, this looks like a glorified power brick. It actually comes with a power brick that's exactly the same size as the dock itself, but this is the dock. The dock gives you an Ethernet connection, audio, two mini display port, and four USB 3. Let me just summarize for you and say this is a piece of crap, don't buy it. It costs too much and it still doesn't work exactly the way that it should. If you're going to try to run two 4K displays with this dock at 60 Hz, it is not going to work. Period. Again, and again at the Surface launch event or whatever, uh, Panos Panay said, oh, in just a minute, we're going to hook this up and power these two 4K displays. Well, that never actually happened because this doesn't work for that. Now, if you're going to run two 1920 by 1080 displays or possibly even two 2560 by 1440 displays off of this, then yes, you can absolutely do that. Two 4K displays, not so much. There are some people that have been able to get this to work with two 4K displays at 30 hertz but they specifically said 4K 60 hertz. The irony is that the Skylake chips actually do support driving two 4K displays at 60 hertz, but this is not wired up. This dock is not wired up in such a way to actually support that. What's worse is if you've got the Surface Book, which has the discrete GPU, this connector actually blocks the DisplayPort connection. This is not the case on the Surface. So if you have the Surface Pro 4 tablet, you can actually use the dock with one DisplayPort connection, as well as a DisplayPort connection on the physical Surface you know, tablet itself, and you can actually power two 4K displays at 60 hertz from the Surface, but you gotta plug in the dock and a monitor separately. With the Surface Book, this blocks the mini DisplayPort connection, so you cannot use the mini DisplayPort connection on the Surface Book without whittling down a cable, and I tried, but this connection is also really, really fiddly. So if you plug this connection in slightly wrong, uh, it doesn't actually make connection, and I'm not really sure why that is. Uh, you just have to sort of wiggle it. So you have something you have to pay attention to when you're magnetically attaching it. And if you move the laptop around while this is connected, it is liable to shift slightly and then it takes the laptop off charge. And unless you notice that, then your laptop will be dead as you, you know, it's, I don't understand, it's on charge. No, the connector was just being fiddly. So I really think Microsoft has, re it's, it's frustrating because it's so close. I mean, Microsoft is on to something with this form factor. Businesses crave this kind of a format. This is really sexy hardware and it almost works perfectly right. Uh, I think 98% of the problems on the Surface Book are down to software and that's probably good because it's going to improve Windows and it's going to make things better for everybody because Microsoft sort of has to eat their own dog food and, and now deal with some hardware oddities that manufacturers for a long time have been saying, hey Microsoft, can we maybe not have a blue screen whenever the PCI bus does something slightly weird, which is what a lot of the blue screen problems that you read about with the Surface Book are. But uh, it's not quite there yet. I think there's going to be a lot of updates to Windows 10 in the spring of 2016 that will hopefully fix a lot of these issues. But, you know, by then we're halfway through the product life cycle. So the Surface Book 2 is probably the, probably the device you want to look for that, where they've sort of solved all these problems. Maybe. I don't know. There's also Skylake shortages right now, so that's maybe another another thing to worry about. But overall, the dock, the dock they completely missed the mark on. Again, it's really exciting and it's especially frustrating because it's almost perfect. They've got the right idea, but the execution, oh, the execution has so many fatal flaws. So overall, what's the final verdict on the Surface Book? Well, 
The hardware is amazing, but you can do better for price versus performance. Now with the detachable screen, there's not a kickstand on it or anything like that. You just carry it around. It's literally just a screen. There's not even any ports on it other than the headphone port and of course the dock connector. You can plug the dock directly into the screen, but you know, the battery life is a little limited on that, two to four hours. You can flip the screen around the other way so that you can, you know, close it and hold it like a book like I was talking about, but the price is really steep. I really, I really wish that Microsoft would, would come down a little bit on the price, but it is new, innovative, interesting hardware. Uh, because it's new, innovative, interesting hardware, the Linux support is not there yet. The Surface Pro 3, it took about six months for good Linux support to show up. And I suspect that's going to be the case with the Surface Book as well. Only because, in terms of the hardware, the hardware is really solid. I'm really impressed with the build quality, and I'm really impressed with all of the other components around the hardware. This is easily one of the best Windows laptops that I've ever used. And in terms of Linux, and in terms of developing a good touch interface that is Linux, that's not Android, this would be a good piece of hardware to do it on were it not so crazy expensive. But it is a very premium feeling device. I also love the screen. The three by two aspect ratio screen, oh, I don't, 16 by nine in a laptop is bad. I had no idea how bad it was until I used the screen on this. 16 by nine is just terrible. I love being able to have two things side by side but have a lot of vertical room for the applications. This screen is really the perfect size. The laptop also doesn't feel heavy or bulky or weird or out of place or anything like that. I really like the screen on the Surface Book. I also like it because the bezels are smaller and the display is really sharp and the color reproduction and all that kind of thing. I also really like Windows Hello. With Windows Hello, the login system basically takes a 3D picture of your face. It's a stereoscopic infrared thing and tries to figure out your face in 3D so it's a little bit more sophisticated than just holding up a picture of your head in order to log you in. And this works like that. And so you can just sort of be in front of the computer and it does face recognition and signs you in. That's really neat, but I really hope a 3D map of my face hasn't been uploaded to the NSA. I suspect it has, because the other neat feature of Windows TH2 was that it sets all your privacy settings back to whatever Microsoft wants. It's like, oh, you, you turn everything off and you disable search and you do all the stuff. Oh, that's cool. You, get, you want the update? Yeah. I'm going to reset all that for you. It was so bad, they, uh, I, I guess people noticed. And then Microsoft was like, hmm, should we not have done that? And they pulled the update. So I think that's been fixed by now, but still, you know, that's very bad. Microsoft's going to do a better job with their, their quality control because I don't need 3D pictures of my face being uploaded. I mean, how crazy would it be if you walk into the Microsoft store and it's like, oh, hey, Bob, how's it going? Yeah, no, welcome to the Microsoft store. It's like, eh, it's not creepy at all. That's... That's just very bad. And overall, there are a lot of software bugs, but in terms of the Windows laptop experience, that's actually really good. And I like the ability to detach the screen and turn it into a tablet and use the pen. I think Microsoft is onto something with this form factor, and I think they're onto something with the pen for everyday computing. Overall, I like that Microsoft is trying to innovate by coming up with new and interesting hardware. That's very good for the ecosystem. I think it's also true that Windows support for hardware is going to improve as a result of this exercise. The fact that Windows, the Windows kernel or the Windows driver architecture can't really deal well with PCI Express flakiness means that the next generation of Windows is going to deal well with high speed peripherals because, you know, Macs have had Thunderbolt for years, but the reason the PCs have never really figured out Thunderbolt is because the bus has direct access to the system memory and a whole lot of the system. And so a lot of PC vendors really see that as a security risk. I mean, you don't want to be able to plug a Thunderbolt device into a computer and have it completely take over the computer the way that it was with Firewire. And so a lot of stuff the last couple of generations has had optional Thunderbolt add-in cards, so you can get a Thunderbolt card for a PC and add it in and use that. But now Microsoft is having to actually use Thunderbolt or at least a hot plug PCI Express connection with their own core hardware. And so that means this part of Windows is really gonna be shored up and it's really gonna be improved. And so I think if Microsoft continues on the path with this, and improves the Surface Book hardware, the ecosystem in six months or even a year is gonna be amazing. I think that it is a really, really expensive device for what it is, and unless you really wanna save on the weight, you really want the portability, or you really want you know the tablet ability, there are other options that are dramatically less expensive that are almost as good. Yeah, they don't use a 15 watt CPU, yeah, they don't have the, the sexy three by two display, um, but you can get a much bigger bang for the buck if that's what you're shopping for. But if you want a super premium, super portable device, uh, this is pretty good. Not only is this pretty good, 
It's also innovative in terms of the hardware form factor. They've really pushed the envelope of, of, of what they're able to do. And I think this is pretty high praise from Microsoft. And overall, this really would be a five-star device if the software were a little bit better. The software being as buggy as it is really detracts from the price tag. And that's really the long and short of it. But the fact they were able to cram a GPU in this thing and they're doing the stuff that they're doing with the hardware, I really like it. So overall, I'm gonna play with this for the next couple of months. If, so if you've got one or you're thinking about getting one of these, head over to the tech forums and let us know. Let us know what your thoughts are. Let us know what your experiences are. I'd be curious to hear from you uh, what your experiences have been for students or people that are taking notes or doing development. I mean, in terms of like a development workstation, this is actually really good. 16 gigabytes of RAM, I can run virtual machines and do all kinds of neat things. So I like that part of it as well. I also like that it's super portable and that the screen is the way that it is. So overall, I'm, I'm fairly satisfied, even though the price tag does sting a little bit. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you in the forums. Mm -hmm.